The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. Do you watch movies by waiting until they come up on broadcast television? Or do you plop in a DVD? Or do you watch them online? You know, the way in which you enjoy and experience a movie or some kind of video production might just be a function of what age group you are. If you're a millennial age person in your 20s or younger, or if you're a Gen Xer in your 30s or 40s, or like me, you're a, in the boomer generation or the builders, you know, that senior generation, you might have a very different expectation of the way you interact with some kind of video presentation. I think that that really has a lot to say about the way in which you and I experience and interact with the message that comes to us about the most important things of our faith in God's Word. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Well, we got any gamers here? Tell me where you are. Are you a gamer? Let's see where the gamers are. Okay. Game video games today are not like Ms. Pac-Man anymore. Now this is, here's a little memo to the older crowd or, the, or those of you who don't, haven't gotten out and lived very much yet. They're, they're stories that suck you in. They are little movies. These aren't just games where you got a rack of points like pinball or something. They're stories that engage you, often historical stories. You might be a, a, one of the Knights Templar or you might be a tank commander in North Africa in World War II or you might be... Um, Lara the Tomb Raider, you know, you might be uh, some female uh, superhero type person. And first you get hooked in the story. There's a mini movie to get you into the story. Then you choose who you want to be in this little, it's called a video game, but really it's a customized movie that you get to be in. Your game controller is your hook to transform and become part of that story. You get to design your own character. Isn't that cool? You get to design who you're going to be, what clothes you're going to wear. You're going to design what weapons you're going to pack. And you can even pause during the game, change all your weaponry around, and go back into the game. And the software is so complex that the game will now take into consideration the fact that you've got a whole bunch of different weapons and adapt accordingly. There's dialogue. You will run into people who will talk to you. We are in it. And it dawned on me, that's Easter. I had, this is my aha moment this week. Because I have this fear that we, we talk about the good news of Easter and the smarter ones of you who think back to last year think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. News is something you don't know. When we use the word news, it's tell me something that has changed. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised but that you came to church on Easter Day and you kind of knew how the story was going to turn out. It's never really at risk, is it? At the end of the service, he's up. He's, I mean, it's, he, it's like it's been done. It's, it's 2,000 years old. How can you call it good news when it happened 2,000 years ago? And my fear, here it is, bluntly put, here is my fear, that you are going to look at the Easter story as a movie and sit passively and think, yeah, great story. Poor Jesus, suffering Jesus, dead Jesus, buried Jesus, he's up, hooray for Jesus, claps and cheers, hallelujah, and then you leave and nothing changes in your life. Then it isn't news. Then it's olds. <laughs> and it's just a movie. And after you've seen it a couple of times, you know, it's like you going back to that DVD sitting on your shelf that you've seen five times. You don't reach for it so fast anymore if you've seen it five times, do you? And here's my terror that Easter gets stale because you know how it turns out and it's the same experience every time. St. Paul wants to give you the awareness that you've been given a game controller. This is not a movie. It's a video game. 
It's an expensive video game. Not a Ms. Pac-Man. This is an interactive one where you become part of the story and it adapts to you and around you and you're a player too. Now you really think I'm tripping, don't you? Well, I didn't make it up. Paul did. Paul didn't make it up. Paul revealed it to you and to me. But I'm quoting his words in a way I hope that makes sense to you. And it's found in Romans chapter 6. And I'd like you to open up your Bible and dig in with me to an extraordinary couple of paragraphs in God's Word. You will never be able to think about Easter in the same way if you're paying attention at this moment. Because Easter is way much more than a cool story of a guy who got a raw deal but eventually won in the end. Romans 6 shows how you're there. You're not just 2,000 years later looking back at something that happened that has no bearing on your life, but you were in and are in that story. Are you ready? Let's have a look. And here's, here is the point. Here's the, this, this thing is the middle part of a long line of argumentation. Here is Paul's point. Our faith is not a bunch of disconnected little pieces floating around out there like creation, God created the world, world fell into sin, Jesus did his redemption, resurrection. You and I are born, live in our own kind of life uh, and struggling on our own. He says, everything is connected. The one automatically leads to the next thing. So what shall we say then is how this paragraph begins. So you can tell the word then shows that this is the middle part of, of a line of thought. And uh, I would urge you at your next available opportunity to go back and read the previous chapter or two to kind of get in the flow of this because there's powerful stuff right before that we just don't have time to go through this morning. What shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? In other words, since everything's all done for us, since the salvation story's a movie, it doesn't matter how we live because it won't affect the movie. If you have a DVD in its plastic box in your hand, you could go hold up a liquor store or shoot up some storefront or be a, act like a total pig and it won't affect that movie, will it? You can go back home after you're done being a jerk and sh play the movie and it'll still play through. People might be tempted to think that because our forgiveness was bought and paid for 100% and given to us that it doesn't make any difference how we live. And there's a certain sick juvenile kind of logic that would support that. All right, let me show you how this works. And my logic is watertight. I defy you to find a leak in my line of thought here. You ready? Forgiveness is a good thing. Yes or no? Yes, it's an awesome thing. It's your best treasure, in fact. Much forgiveness is better than little forgiveness. Yeah, I can't argue with that, can you? Uh, if you sin a little, you get a little forgiveness, right? If you sin a lot, you will need a lot of forgiveness. Am I right? Okay, we're all good. there's not a leak so far, have you? Okay then, in order to get a lot of forgiveness, which I just heard you identify as a good thing, what do you have to do? Sin a lot. Perfect, isn't it? Find the flaw in that logic. So should we go on sinning that grace may increase? In other words, uh, the rottener I am, the better God will look. Boy, that's, that's brilliant too, isn't it? By no means, he says. We died to sin. Hey, that isn't just a story of long ago. You're in it. Do you realize what was going on on Calvary? In a way, much more than just Jesus being crucified. Look what all is involved there. We died to sin on Calvary. Your rotten old sinful self, its maggoty carcass was nailed to the cross along with Jesus. How can we live in it any longer? This, I, I was, can frame it in this way. How, the fact that you're forgiven doesn't give you a license to go and be a pig all over again. Hello? If, if there's some guy who betrays his wife and has this lousy affair and then 
finally can't stand the guilt anymore and confesses it. And against all hope, against every expectation, she forgives the guy and takes him back into the marriage. He doesn't say, cool, I can call my girlfriend again. That'd be absurd. The fact that she showed mercy makes you want to love and rededicate yourself all the more to your marriage. It doesn't give you a license to be a pig. Paul is saying this, we died as in, how can we live in it any longer? Don't you know, now here here's comes the three amazing things. Here's your game controller that's pulling you into the game. And you probably didn't know it, but your game controller, and I'm speaking, you know, don't quote me on that, this is a, just an analogy, but your hook, the channel, the pipeline, the connector that makes you part of Holy Week is your baptism. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus got connected to three huge pieces of Holy Week? You were baptized into his death. So your baptism is interactive in that you're now on the cross with Christ and your sins are being punished and you're in hell with Jesus. Everything that should have come on you is being rained down on you. So it's not like you slid away and your debts never got paid. Oh, they were paid. And your baptism puts you there with Christ. We were therefore buried with him. Again, how? Through what? Pretty feeble. Let's try that again. We were therefore buried with him through baptism. Your baptism made you a part of the burial of Christ by linking you with your, well, call him an avatar. That's, a, that's one of the words you use when you have a, a virtual identity online. Through the miracle and power and mystery of God, your baptism put you in the cave, wrapped you up in linen like a mummy, packed you with 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes, laid you flat, and then rolled the rock, and you with Jesus were in that damp, utter darkness as that rock slammed into place, closing off all the sunlight, and then you could hear the seal being pounded into place. You were in there too through your baptism. And his burial becomes your burial, the last burial. Into death. You were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was. Here's number three raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Who else leads a new life? We too. The baptized participate in the resurrection. This isn't a movie. This isn't just a story, a cute story that you listen to and now have some trivia answers in case the questions ever come up. This is a living reality that transports you back two millennia in time and you re-experience the greatest events in human history, and it's all through your baptism. Now, what this unfortunately has stepped right on top of one of the major controversies that has split Protestants in half for many centuries, and you and I are not going to solve that or fix that today. But I can understand why some people think of baptism because it's humble in its appearance. It's just water. And because it's administered by a human being seems like just a human action. I, un I get why some people really are convinced it is a ritual action that makes you think of something that God has done. I get that. But there's so much more than that. Baptism is more than, let's say, making the sign of the cross, which is a ritual action that helps you remember something else. Or on Ash Wednesday, putting ashes on your forehead doesn't have any significance of the doing of it. It's just an action to help you remember we are but dust and ashes. So it's a, it's a bit of drama, but baptism is more. It is your connector because everything baptism does for you is not done by the human being, whether the pastor or whoever who does the baptizing. And it certainly is not just plain old water. There's nothing in the water but water. But it's God's Word working through that that uses the water simply as a touch point, as a connector. What changes everything is Christ's suffering, Christ's death, 
Christ's burial, Christ's resurrection. And your baptism simply connects you to that power. This is why you are forgiven. Through your baptism, you receive everything Christ did for you and with you in Holy Week. Did you catch that? Man, I, I, I'm trying to make this as plain as I can because it's, it's head spinning. For you and with you, everything you, through the sacrament, through your faith, are experiencing comes to you fully. Through the resurrection of Christ, which, is touch, which touches you through word and water, there is no more condemnation. Your guilt is gone. Your fear is gone because you have God's solemn promise now. You've been marked and sealed with the Holy Spirit as though he'd put his tattoo right on you where you can see it, where the angels are absolutely certain who are, who are God's chosen and anointed and who isn't. There is no more death. You are now immortal like Christ. There is no more hell. All the hell for you has already been suffered on the cross. And you are set free from that. Now there's one further point, and this is the point that St. Paul really hammers on. Don't just sit down now and say, well, that was cool. Because now the changes in you continue. Not only the changes from doubt to confidence, not only the change from guilty to not guilty, not only the change from mortal and dying to immortal and endless, now comes the change now, for you were saved not only to go to heaven someday, but you're saved now for God to use in his kingdom building. Because so many people don't fully understand what's wrong with us people, with the human race. So many people don't know what Christ has done to make it right, how to get that rightness, that righteousness from Christ. We too may live a new life. Easter frees us not only from the guilt of sin, but the power of sin too. And the next three paragraphs, in very strong language, challenge you not just to think about Easter, but to live Easter. Not just Jesus' Easter, live your Easter. If we've been united with him in his death, we'll certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Our old self was crucified with him. So the body of sin might be rendered what? Those of you with your Bibles out, rendered what? Powerless. You need to get it, stay, keep your nose in that passage. You need to know where to find this because you wouldn't believe it if it was just me telling it to you. Sin, powerless over me? I'm such an old bag of rebellion and I'm cranky and I'm lazy and I'm left a string of damage behind me in my life and I'm selfish and blah, blah, blah. And you think, powerless? Man, I, I, it'd be a miracle if I slid into heaven and didn't get thrown into hell. Scripture says sin is rendered powerless so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Anyone who's died has been freed from sin. If we died with Christ, we'll live with him. Christ raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death he died, he died to sin once for all. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Don't offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but offer them, the parts of your body, to him as instruments of righteousness. Sin shall not be your master because you're not under law. You are under grace. This brings us full circle to his argumentation about, I guess I can live any way I want. Now that I'm in the clear, I got my get out of hell free card, I can do anything I want. Wrong. Your heart changes. The old selfishness has been crucified with Christ. You are now freed to go crazy, to live daringly, to live like a servant. No better than that, to live like a slave. You're freed to give of yourself, to be useful to an agenda, not of your designing, but to be useful and let God use you as his instrument. 
He invites you to look at your body as instruments of righteousness. Start with your hands. Look at them. Take a minute now. Just look at your two hands. As slaves of sin, these can be instruments of great cruelty. You can hit and hurt people with them. You can write things with these hands that bring harm to others. Uh, You can type things on your computer that bring harm to yourself and others. You can uh, use them to swear falsely and lie with them. You can use them to steal or you can use them as a servant. Look, can't look at your lips, you only can in a mirror, but you're dimly aware that they're flapping away below your nose, like mine is flapping at you right now. These are instruments of either evil or righteousness. Part of the Easter surge is letting the Easter good news flow through you that your mouth becomes an instrument of healing and encouragement. Our mouths often are used to belittle, to ridicule, to put down, to mock, to gossip, to undercut, to start rebellion, to grind away at people's reputations. Instead, let your mouth be a builder's tool, one of the instruments that God uses to build and encourage other people. Most everybody I know is dying for some encouragement. I have never yet found anybody so self-secure that they don't smile a little bit when you offer them some kind words or some praise. We're all dying for it because our spirits half live in despair half the time. Sometimes we're silent. Not only it's not enough just to stop mocking or belittling people, but there's so many opportunities we've had to build people up, and instead we look away or we're silent. And our instruments of righteousness didn't move at all. They froze or thought, too bad for you, sister. Too bad for you, buddy. I got other problems and I'm moving on. I challenge you to figure out in your life how Easter will change the seven days ahead of you starting now. Knowing that you are forgiven. Knowing that you are loved from all eternity. Knowing that you have been crucified with Christ in your baptism connects you to that story, not as just an observer, but a participant. Knowing your old carcass of sin has been dead and buried, knowing that the new you has burst out, knowing that you're forgiven of the guilt of your sin, but also set free from the smothering power of your sin. How will your life be different for the next seven days, knowing that you not only know the Easter story, but you are participating in the Easter story. That's what I want you to think about. Amen. I have to tell you what a comfort it is to me to know that I've already been buried with Christ and I've already risen with him. That takes all the fear out of my life. It's as though I've died already. I can't die again. I can live my life joyfully whether there's two days left, whether there are two years left or 20 years or more left. I can live it to the full knowing that since I've already died and risen, I am immortal with Christ. What a big deal that is. It means that I can live in joy. I can live and tie into God's agenda and not worry that I'm going to be cheated out of some experiences. It means that I can simply live and make the most out of every minute knowing that I have an eternity ahead of me and there will be plenty of time for everything that is in my heart that I'd really love to do. I'd love for you to have that same security as well and joy through Christ, being buried with him and rising again with him already, setting you free for a life without fear and a life full of joyful service to him. Don't go away. I'm going to be back in just a minute to pray with you. In a world where time slips by too fast, pressures increase and dreams fade away, Pastor Mark Jeske wants to remind you that more than anything in the world, God cares about you. That's the message Pastor Jeske and our Time of Grace team are taking around the world into homes just like yours. But we can't do it alone. 
We need people just like you who believe in this bold dream to help us share this life-saving, life-changing message with the world. You can take this opportunity now to become one of Pastor Jeske's Grace Partners. When you send your regular monthly gift of $20 or more, you'll receive a special monthly letter from Pastor Jeske, plus four messages from Pastor Jeske each year that will never be seen on television. Our way of saying thank you for your partnership. You'll also receive special Time of Grace resources throughout the year. Call us right now to become a Grace Partner with Pastor Jeske and Time of Grace. I never cease to be amazed at how many people assume that the airtime for broadcasting Time of Grace was donated by the stations. No way. We have to pay market rate for all of the airtime in all of the different areas in broadcast over the air television, cable, and satellite to enable Time of Grace to come to you. To all of you whose financial gifts have made these broadcasts possible, I want to say thank you today. And if you have not yet made a financial gift to Time of Grace this year, let me ask you today, right now, to pray and consider becoming my partner so that you can join your voice to mine and we can share good news of Jesus' resurrection and the forgiveness and hope he gives to as many people as possible before it's too late. I'd like to join with you in praying today. Let's bring our thanks to our Lord Jesus for his amazing resurrection. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you were willing to do for us. What an awesome victory you have won. Death and sin, Satan, hell and the grave have all been defeated. And our baptism connects us with you. We're buried with you. And we also have risen with you. Now we can live without fear, serving you, giving you the glory you deserve. We pray in your holy name. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske reminding you that every day is a day of God's wonderful grace for you. Pastor Mark has two booklets for you. Is There Hope for Me explains in very simple terms God's love for sinners and what Jesus did for us all. And the April through June edition of the Grace Moments devotional is available. Inspired words to guide your day in a convenient pocket format. Both booklets are available for a gift of any amount. Request yours by mail at P.O. Box 301 Milwaukee by visiting timeofgrace.org or by calling 800-661-3311. And you can add some inspiration to your newsfeed when you like Time of Grace on Facebook. We post Bible verses, photos, updates, and more. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, You'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org. And pray about becoming a Grace Partner, an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching. And join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. The preceding program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.